Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of In Conversation. And our guest today really needs no introduction. We are excited here to talk with none other than Mr. Steve Hackett. Welcome. Nice to be talking to you, Joseph. Thank you. Well, you looks like you got a lot of busy, busy things happening here. I had here. We got a new album coming out uh, Friday, the 16th of February. That's right. Uh, yeah comes out on the 16th for sure yeah circus and the night well on inside out music um before we dig into the album itself let's just uh, dig yep. into the title how did you arrive at the title for the album um well i was writing stuff with my wife um we were talking about something that was semi-autobiographical and um she's the one who suggested the title and the and the third person traveler um so um we came up with the story uh together uh it's a bit bit like flashpoints in my life and then we took it to areas where no one could have experienced it but um uh, but uh, uh, it becomes more symbolic metaphorical and dreamlike as it continues on so there's a third person um in order to cover ourselves if you know what i mean all right, and then uh, the uh, album cover, definitely a unique cover there. Uh, how did that come about? Uh, is there like a process you go through uh, when coming up with album covers? Yeah, we were thinking of of of, of a whale, a, a big whale's mouth swallowing a circus and um, a circus tent. So, um, of course, on vinyl, it's it's very large so the vinyl people get get a large um oops i don't know if i can do that there we go <laughs> there we are something like that circus tent and um, there's a little bit of the battersea power station in the background you have to look very closely at the detail to see that mm -hmm. but anyway there we go <laughs> yeah um it was it was done by a lady called denise marsh who's one of our friends uh, we know her as dizzy and she's very much an individual she likes to wear very very colorful clothes and she's um she's kind of most people would say eccentric um but she's got a lovely album sleeve and so we're very very pleased with how that worked out yeah it definitely stands out really well all right well let's get into the uh album itself the concept album here um so how did you come about writing a concept album that is about your own experiences. Is this something you started to write, you know, just over recently, yeah. or has it been something you've been working on over a very long period of time? Well, I think over a long period of time, um, I, I did a book, a, an autobiography um, <clears throat> during lockdown. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was out then. And um, uh, this is a kind of companion piece, but obviously it's um, a musical version of some of the aspects of that um it's funny how, how it all took shape um <clears throat> most of it is built out of conversations that that joe and i were having sometimes i would write a song or a lyric and then she'd be the one who might come up with the title and sometimes vice versa <clears throat> um she sets me challenges at times uh, we've done that with songs in the past that that Sometimes she's written a whole lyric and I've come up with music that'll support that and down the line. And I, of course, I, I, I try and convince her to be uh, flexible with the meter in order to fit six, eight or four, four or whatever it might be. Um, it's it's uh, really uh, to talk about the whole process. I think that things take time because something that Bertram Russell said um, that all seriously good work needs a long incubation period a kind of uh you really need to be able to think about it dream it live with it for a while so it needs that subconscious incubation period in order um you know to, to make it really work so this one was full of challenges and the challenges were also with time um I recorded two tracks before we got into the main brunt of, 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 of the thing. And um, but at some shows, because we were doing tons of shows, 
and I wasn't at home a lot. So we were recording shows at live venues. Uh, we were recording uh, uh, drums live, or rather at sound checks in, in live halls, live venues. And um, I think I think that worked very well. It meant that I could be ahead of the game and just get on with things when we were finally back on terra firma, back home. <clears throat> so um, there's there's so many different textures on this album, so much variety. Uh, was that something that just happened or was it intentional, a little both? <laughs> yeah, I, I thought, you know, the idea of having musical surprises has been something that's been, you know, driving the writing for quite some time. To have unexpected twists and turns within the music um, is largely what drove this this album, especially right at the beginning. The idea of trying to convey 1950, the year that I was born, um, what radio sounded like at that time, uh, the attitudes, the way um, a newscast was being presented, the Pathé News, British black and white newsreels, distorted radio um, snippets from, from that time. Um, there was a program called Listen With Mother and um, children's show. Right at the beginning, they would say, are you sitting comfortably? Long pause, then I'll begin. In America, that's probably never, ever been heard, but, but all British people know this. Um, and uh, it, it's when the BBC were at their most patronising <clears throat> with children. Entertainment was much, much slower. Now it would all be wham, pow, wham, blah, blah, blah. Maybe there's no point trying to get them to sit down. That's just not going to happen. It's just one of a number of things that's going on. But um, this idea of being very, um, almost as if you were going to receive some sort of lesson and they were going to require you to be grown up for a moment to be able to absorb this. So right at the beginning, we've got this, this kind of entreaty to, um, um, are you sitting comfortably? Straight away, instead of the long pause, we've got a baby's cry. The baby is obviously very uncomfortable. Then the baby's cry becomes and mixes with a uh, an oncoming steam train, which, when it gets up to full speed, becomes uh, a string orchestra, marcato strings, uh, driving strings, then that gives way to a rock band. So all this sort of stuff happens right at the beginning to kind of wrong foot you and um, uh, lead you into the album in a, in a, in a, a series of surprises or trapdoors. You thought it was one thing, then it's another, then it's another, then it's another. So I guess <clears throat> it's probably all the Beatles' fault, really. <laughs> now, um, the uh, sequencing for the album, um... How did you come about deciding, you know, where to put what where and everything? Because it seems like, uh, you know, being a concept album, it really flows. You know, this is one of those albums that you have to play it from beginning to end, really, I feel, uh, to really take it all in and get a feel of everything. Um, well, I think it's great if I can retain everyone's interest to that degree. Um, the first track was really all about London. Um, the Smoke is a nickname for London, uh, especially when it was post-war, heavily polluted, very smoky, um, industry being driven by coal, particularly the, the Battersea Power Station, which um, has been made more famous by Pink Floyd. The Battersea Power, Power Station was what was opposite my bedroom window as a kid, looking over the Thames, looking the other side. Uh, Pink Floyd delivered that with a flying pig, of course, decades later. Um, but that's the building, which was the largest in Europe. It was definitely um, powered by coal and it provided light and heat for half of London. And it was the biggest building in Europe, if I haven't already said so. At the time, it was the largest building in Europe. And even now, it's huge. When you, can, you can visit it. It's decommissioned as a power station. But um, now you can go inside, it's all sorts of things, um, a shopping mall, 
uh, you can take a, an elevator up inside one of the giant um, chimneys, the smokestacks, and it can take about 30 people. You get to the top and you've got this 360 degree view of London. It's the most spectacular trip. It's most unusual. And right at the top, I can look back at what was going on for me on the other side of the water um, 70 years ago. Um, when I was looking out of my bedroom window, I can see the same apartment blocks there that, that we grew up in. There's a tree in the way of my of my bedroom window, so I, I can't actually see my bedroom window, but I used to be able to see it out of it. They should take the tree down, of course, and stick up a blue plaque, but that's a whole other ball game. Um, it's rather lovely, all of that. So first track is all about London, and uh, we take off from there. London post-war, in recovery, lots of London, particularly Pimlico, the area I grew up in, destroyed by bombing. Um, and I grew up in these apartments, or flats as we call them over here, in the old country, um, Churchill Gardens. And each, each block was named after a writer, a musician, a poet. And the first two blocks that were built were Gilbert and Sullivan. So Gilbert on one hand and Sullivan on the other. So famous writers, composers, um, other blocks were named after Coleridge, Keats, De Quincey, uh, Jane Austen, all of this uh, kind of stuff. And of course it was called Churchill Gardens in honor of he who, uh, the guy in government who, who, who won the war for us, managed to talk the Americans into coming into the fray eventually. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, um, uh, I've got a lot, a lot of affection for the place when I, when I, when I go, go back, you know, a lot of affection for it. And especially the, with the way it's presented now. now. Now everything is rebuilt. There is no more rationing. And there is no more smoke. Um, but, you know, it's peopled with ghosts for me. And I put it into this, the opening song, the opening salvo. Hey, um, let's talk about a few of the standouts here. Uh, Enter the Ring. Sure. Can you tell us about how that came about? Um, Enter the Ring is a song written in, I would say, in Genesis, Genesis clothing, really. Um, there's um, 12 string stuff and bass pedals. Uh, so it's being driven by strumming. It's pretty folky with a little bit of electronica, courtesy of something that sounds like bass pedals. Um, something that we used to do with Genesis, 12 string guitars and, and, uh, and, and bass pedals. Um, an odd combination for a rock band, but I've used it again in true Genesis style as that track really into the ring is really all about Genesis. What is, uh, I was about to join Genesis at that time. Um, so that track has all the sort of progressive um, clues in it, time signatures, um, harmonies, lots of, lots of detail, guitar solos, flute stuff. Uh, I could see my brother playing scat flute, you know. Um, and um, uh, beyond that, uh, the, the next track is really um, uh, not so much a celebration of Genesis, but talking about the, the more claustrophobic aspect of it. So um, get, by the time it's getting me out, it's wanting to leave the band, wanting to leave the circus. Uh, that's what it, what it leads on to. So you get the sort of twin aspects of that. And the second track, uh, actually track number six, Get Me Out, is kind of bluesy. Uh, it's a little bit of um, the Perry Mason theme. I always liked that. And it scared me to death when I was a kid. So I wanted to do this kind of rock noir version of, of that with some shredding guitar and... Um, uh, 
try and channel a few people that uh, oh, at one point there's a, there's a little bit of Nina Simone in there. I'm trying to do her vibrato at one point and uh, not with the guitar, but with, with the voice. Not that I'm ever going to sound like Nina Simone, who incidentally met my mother years ago. Nina Simone and my mother were in a restaurant together and they got riotously drunk together. But that's beside the point. Nina Simone's so very, very clever as a, as a songwriter, singer, and of course, classical pianist, uh, who, you know, uh, the little girl who was not allowed to go to the conservatory because she happened to be the wrong color. But what developed after that was something extraordinary. Another song on here that uh, to me stands out is Into the Night Well there. Um, how did that all yes. come about? Well, as I said, the title of, of the album was suggested by Jo, and she had an idea that the, the Night Well was something like um, Time of Greatest Challenges, uh, the demons that had to be faced, um, having made that leap of faith, um, the idea that events can potentially swallow you up, you can go under. Um, I know that I was very close to a, a nervous breakdown at one point when I was trying to pull away from another situation beyond, beyond uh, a genesis. This was something to do with um, a management situation where um, it, it, it was life at its most difficult. At one point I was in a hotel room and I couldn't stop shaking and I thought I, I got to get a grip on myself. And so the night whale is really all about that. And, and it was, I was at the point when I realized that being involved with Joe, who's become my future wife and collaborator, um, the moment that I realized that um, I needed to prioritize her over myself, um, I knew that I needed to look after her full time um, and I think it's, it's the sort of transformative thing that happened, the process of going through that um, made me stronger. And actually it was the thing that I was, I was looking for. I, I, I thought it was going to be a sacrifice, but actually uh, Jo was really able to show me what she could do once we were a, uh, a full-time couple. Um, so that's a little bit of the night whale is that the uh, the circus is really the whole of of the music business all of it has been a three ring circus for me uh, living out of a suitcase for so many years you know 50 years plus of of touring and I'm still doing it but loving it yeah speaking of that it looks like 2024 is going to be another busy year for you touring wise uh, you'll be back in the states uh yeah, in March and then April, finishing up some Fox Trot at fifty dates, and then uh, you'll be doing uh, some other different countries there, doing Genesis greats, Lamb highlights, and other solo stuff. Um, yeah. So that second part there, the Genesis greats and Lamb highlights and stuff, um, is that yep. going to be coming down to the U.S. for some of those shows anytime down the road at all? I would say after we've delivered the Foxtrot commitments, which largely concentrates on the American South that I haven't played for quite some time, um, the invitation came to do that. And uh, I think what will happen is because we just did two months back to back in the States at the end of last year, and now we're doing another two months at the beginning of this year, um, there'll be a, a gap as I get to play the rest of the world. and um, and then we'll come back probably in 2025 with um, not just another one of the cruises, but also um, uh, with lamb highlights and, and many other things, possibly with more things from Circus and the Night Whale. See, the thing is that that album is, seems to be being received very well already. I've had more press on this thing than, than I've ever had. So, um, uh, I know I'm feeling the weight of expectation of saying, yes, okay, you know, the Genesis repetitive stuff, but what about, you know, your solo stuff? So, yeah, the solo stuff will be in there too. Difficult balancing act to try and get things from all eras of, of, of the background. 
Well, when you had a such a long, great career like yours, it, it, it must be tough to decide what you want to play <clears throat> when you got so many albums to choose from. Yeah, there's a lot of honoring the past and those honoring those early Genesis days that um, John Lennon said such nice things about the band said that he thought that we were true sons of the Beatles and I'm, I'm very happy he said that. Um, um, and I've tried to live up to that, on, particularly on this, on this album, to fill it with as many surprises as there are or there were from, from Beatle albums. So without being straight ahead, you know, just have these false fronts and starts to things to contextualize songs and uh, uh, another rabbit out of the hat, just when you were expecting a Harley Davidson. So yesterday was uh, was an anniversary here, uh, exactly to the date, 48th anniversary of A Trick of the Tail. Being the first one, you know, after Peter left, how, yes. do, you look, how do you look back at it now, today? Yeah, it's ironic that that came out um, on Peter Gabriel's birthday, the album that was post post him um i just sent him a a, a thing on his birthday and, and joe's just told me that he's just gotten back to me so i've just got to read what he's what he's said and um it's um i think it was an interesting album i think there's some very strong things on it um i particularly like the opening track and the closing track for me that's the strongest um the things in between um i'm mainly responsible for um entangled and bits of the opening one and um quite a lot of of uh los endos which is really my melody um phil's rhythm my melody um and there's some other tracks on it that i i, I like as well i think ripples is yeah. very nice I particularly like the instrumental in the in the uh, in the middle of it. Um, uh, in, in some ways, I thought that was another Firth of Fifth. Interesting, it, but it, I know that it doesn't have the long-term appeal of a Firth of Fifth on that guitar solo. But um, but nonetheless, it was important to me. <laughs> 